Welcome to the Dietitian Side Hustle Podcast. My name is Katie Dodd, and I'm a nutrition entrepreneur. I spent seven years as a side hustler before diving into entrepreneurship full time. Before making the leap, I was bringing in six figures through my side hustle. If I can do it, you can too. This podcast is for dietitians, interns, and students who want to be inspired to start or perfect the side hustle of their dreams. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to the 216th episode of the Dietitian Side Hustle podcast, empowering dietitians to make more money. And I am so excited to have on the podcast, the one and only Holly Larson. Now, Holly has been on the podcast twice before. Most recently was episode 156, where she was talking about the Dietitian Money Conference. And coincidentally, kind of for a reason... (laughs) We actually are going to be talking about the Dietitian Money Conference again towards the end. We're going to be talking about all kinds of fun stuff in between then. But before we really dive in, I want to let anyone know who is listening to this relatively live. So this is airing on um, September 11th, 2024. So Holly is hosting the second annual Amazing Dietitian Money Conference called From Underpaid to Empowered, a conference for dietitians. And it is running September 24th to 26th, 2024. And right now, if you're listening to this anytime between now and September 18th, early bird is running, which means you can save 50% off. If it's after the 18th and before the 24th, you still want in because it's still an amazing deal and you aren't going to want to miss this. Now to register, I want you guys to go to katiedodd.com. katiedodd.com is my link tree page and on it, there's my little affiliate link. So I am an affiliate and the gifts that I give to you when you join through my link is that you're going to get a group call with me because like Holly, I love to talk about money. We're going to keep the conversation going after the conference. You'll also get my top tips for getting the most out of the Dietitian Money Conference and my freebie folder jam packed with all of the freebies that I offer in one place. So I want to give a quick shout out about that. We'll be talking more about that towards the end of this episode. But let's start by introducing Holly. So Holly, welcome. Um, I feel like people who listen to my podcast probably know you because I do talk about you a lot because I adore you so much. But for those oh. who don't know <laughs> Holly, Holly is a registered dietitian. She is a amazing entrepreneur and she wears multiple hats because like many dietitians, she is multi-passionate. She loves copywriting. She loves um, writing. She loves um, blogging, helping other dietitians to blog effectively but she also loves leading this charge of talking about money and not just complaining about money online. If we don't make enough money, people should give us more, but having conversations, looking at the big picture and empowering dietitians on what we can do to make more money because we know maybe it feels good to write something online complaining, but what feels better is actually make more money. And Mm -hmm. there are things we can do about it. So That was my little lineup. So maybe you could introduce to our listeners a little bit more about who you are, Holly. (laughs) Thanks, Katie. And thanks for having me. And I feel like we're in the mutual admiration fan club. (laughs) Um, Thank you for the introduction. I am a fellow registered dietitian. I have taken quite a wandering path in my career. (laughs) Um, But most recently I've landed, most of my work is in copywriting. So I... Copywriting means writing that helps people to take action, not just writing that is meant to entertain or inform. And dietitians tend to be far more comfortable teaching. We don't tend to be as comfortable asking people to take action, like engage with our services and make a purchase. Um, But that's what I help with. And Katie, something that you and I both love talking about is mindset. And mindset really matters how you show up in writing. So I'm I'm a copywriting copywriter and copywriting mentor. And so we talk about mindset a lot because your mindset and your beliefs are the lens through which you see the world. And as human beings, we want to confirm our own beliefs, which is why mindset work is so important. That if you believe dietitians will only ever be underpaid. There's plenty of evidence to support that belief. There are lots of examples of dietitians who are underpaid. But what I aim to do, this passion project of hosting the money conference, is to be able to give people information and encouragement 
and to start these conversations so that people who are interested in being solution oriented to making a difference that when we work together, we can make a difference. Um, that those are the people I'm really interested in meeting with at the money conference so that we can move the needle and advocate for compensation in alignment with the value we provide because it's huge. Yes, absolutely. I would love if you could share a little bit more about why you are on this mission. Like what, what got you so excited about talking about money that you decided to host this whole conference? Because I know this is a lot of work. It is a labor of love, but what is it that sparked that fire in you to really go down this direction? It is a labor of love. I thank you for that. (laughs) Um, And to be honest, sometimes it feels a little audacious that I'm hosting this conference because I don't have all the answers. I don't have everything in my own financial life figured out. Um, And I've made lots of mistakes with money. Um, But perhaps a wiser version of myself um, is hosting this conference as a love letter to me as a new grad and to every dietitian new grad. Because at that time, I knew enough to know that women are underpaid in general and women are paid less than men on average for the same work. Um, And that needs to change. Um, And I didn't quite know how underpaid dietitians were. But when I was applying for my first jobs after finishing grad school, lots of student loans, um, and I went to this interview in a WIC clinic and I got this job offer. I didn't realize at the time just how bad the offer was. Like it didn't feel good, but I didn't know just how bad it was. (laughs) And I said, is that negotiable? She said, no. And that was the whole conversation, four words. (laughs) And I was embarrassed. Um, Although since then, I've learned that most people don't even negotiate or try to negotiate. So I guess I was above average in that. But the long answer to your question, Katie, is that having information on how to have financial literacy, how to have information about how to evaluate a job offer, how to evaluate what your needs are based on where you live in the country and what your cost of living is and what your financial status is in terms of student loans and your preferred lifestyle and all of those things like do need to pay for childcare, all of those impact what your minimum salary can be in order to live your life. And these things aren't talked about. Mm-hmm. Katie, I'm quoting you to say they teach us how to be dietitians in school. They don't teach us how to be entrepreneurs and businessmen and women. They don't teach us how to do copywriting. They don't teach us a lot of things that are really important skills And the thing is, the longer it takes you to figure out financial skills in terms of saving and investing and negotiating and having a good resume and being present on LinkedIn and all of the things that can contribute to our financial story, our financial life, the longer it takes to figure that stuff out, the less money you're going to make in your whole lifetime. And that has impacts on your whole life. Yeah. One thing I actually really like that you're talking about, Holly, is how we're all in very different situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people, they were blessed to have scholarships or parents who paid for school. Some people had to pay for it all themselves and continue years into the career to have very heavy loads of debt. Some dietitians may be in a situation where a partner makes a good amount of money and they don't have to stress about it. Other people, it's all on them. Maybe they're a single parent and they've got to provide everything. So I think it's important to understand that we are all in different situations when it comes to money, but also there's like no wrong or right way to have a money conversation because, you know, regardless of if you're like, like, I need more money or like, I'm good. This is such an important conversation that we need to have. Yes. Yes. Money is freedom in a lot of ways. And I think as a, as a profession that is largely women, our societal things that we've been indentured with in terms of what we should be and how we should interact with money is problematic. Yeah. We're conditioned to make 
other people comfortable more than ourselves. And that's problematic. And we're conditioned not to talk about money. That's problematic. Mm -hmm. And secrecy only benefits people who are taking advantage of others. Transparency helps us all. So I think most dietitians, Katie, are more comfortable talking about poop than money. I think hundred percent. And so I'm not perfect about talking about money either. I'm much more confident talking about my rates and my prices and money than I used to be, but that just Mm -hmm. comes with practice. So the more that we can practice having these conversations, practice having negotiations, practice being able to quantify the impact of our work, we'll get better at it. And the more of us who are doing it, the easier it will be for us as a whole. Yeah, gosh. Gosh, I have a few things I'd like to share if that's okay. Because as we're talking about this, I'm like, oh. I, I think for me, because you know, I just got done with the blog boss mastermind, a little mastermind I run. They came in Oregon, um, came here to Oregon, and we were talking about money and how sometimes the the answer to um things being better, things being happier, life being good isn't always more money. We have to be content with what we have because knowing that more money doesn't necessarily mean I'll be happy then. So one of the things I do as a coach, like, of course, I want you to make more money. Of course, I want you to grow and build, but I want to make sure that you're taking care of all the stuff on the inside that you are having joy in the everyday as you continue to grow. So all that to say, I don't think that money is the answer to all of our problems. We can have joy right now, regardless of situation. Even if you're like pulling your hair out of, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. You can still have joy and peace in your day while trying to find out creative solutions to do what you need to do with life. But I also believe that money can help provide so many different types of freedom, so many different types of freedom. And I always think of how good people do good things with money. Having lots of money doesn't make you a bad person. All it does is make you more of who you are. And dietitians are such good people. They are caring. They got in this field to help people. And I want to see dietitians with more money because I know they will do more good with money. And I think about what money has done for me. Money has given me freedom in every aspect of the word. It has given me the freedom to become a full-time entrepreneur so that I get to be present with my kids. That is more valuable than anything. Money has given me the freedom to be who I am, have healthy, strong relationships, and just to do to live a life I never thought was possible. So I think there's two sides of the coin and I don't I don't even know where this came from but you said something that really something in there triggered something in me um Holly but but I think it's just an important discussion to have that money doesn't equal joy we can have joy every day right now it's doing the internal work but yes money is amazing because it gives us freedom even the freedom of like we see someone on like one of our friends on Facebook who's in a hard you know in a hard time and they've got to go fund me the freedom of being able to donate to them and to help someone in need and like to give to charities that you love or to help people who can't pay for services like that's cool to be able to yes. use money to do good things so i don't know why i wanted to talk about that but i'll get off that little soapbox now Oh, I, I'm on your side. And I think that, I think sometimes people think that it's greedy to want more money or we picture like Donald Duck diving into the piles of coins as like, that's what it means to be wealthy. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't have a pile of coins to dive into yet. That would be nice in the future. And yes, that would give me the leverage to be able to donate to more people. And You know, I'm not that interested in buying more stuff, Katie. I'm really interested in services. Like I am so grateful to have a lawn care service. I hate mowing the lawn and it's a privilege to be able to afford that. And I'm very grateful for that. And every time he comes and does a bomb, awesome job taking care of my lawn in 20 minutes with like his huge industrial machines, I'm grateful. And I have a lady who cleans my house. She's lovely. And she comes twice a month. And I'm so grateful for that. And it's having the money to purchase those services gives me more freedom to be in my business and just more freedom to be with my kid. I have a two and a half year old and he's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was one of the first things that I did as I started making more money is getting a housekeeper which is so lovely because I'm supporting a local entrepreneur in my community with her business. And it's giving me 
more time freedom to do things that I'm most passionate about. So yeah, money can do some pretty awesome things. And like you, I'm not like, I don't just want to buy all the fancy thing. I I more want it's time for me. That's the most important thing is time with the people that I love and also for taking care of me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Awesome. Okay. So gosh, we've already, I'm looking at my list of questions and I think we're only two in, we, we started talking. So, <laughs> okay. I have a question and it's, it's kind of a silly question and I, I already kind of know the answer, but I think it's a, important. So, um, this is a very oversimplified question, but why Holly don't dietitians make more money? Mm. I'll answer that as succinctly as I can. <clears throat> Um, but if we can channel our little inner golden girls, picture it, it was 1965. And after a 45 year campaign at long last, Medicare was enacted. Um, and Medicare, as everyone probably knows, is the insurance program subsidized by our own taxes for the elderly and retired. Um and it wasn't until 1965 that it existed. But the kicker is that while lots of healthcare professionals were specifically mentioned as covered by Medicare, dietitians were not. And so that position in a hospital setting where dietitians mainly worked at that time, things are changing now. Um, but at that time, dietitians were mainly in the hospital. And because they were not reimbursed, their care was not reimbursed by Medicare. It positioned dietitians as an expense rather than income re income generating. Mm -hmm. And so that stinks. So because of that, we've been playing a game of catch up of advocacy and being able to yeah. quantify the value. Like there's no magical piggy bank, like hospitals, just like any other organization are managing a budget of their resource and money is one of their resources. And so there's not just a magical piggy bank. They'd be like, well, we'll pay these people because we should, and they should. Um, but it wasn't until dietitians had been able to quantify the impact of working with a dietitian with peer reviewed research to say, yes, there's a cost to cover working with a dietitian, but the impact of that is that the patients are healthier and those healthier patients cost our healthcare system less money. It's an investment. Shocker. I know to all dietitians, but it takes a while for that work to happen. So between 1965 until the Affordable Care Act was enacted, when dietitian services were covered a lot more broadly, in between there, I forget the exact date off the top of my head, Katie, um, that the first things that were covered were diabetes and renal because there were peer-reviewed research to and lots of advocacy work by the academy to say working with dietitians saves your healthcare system money and provides better outcomes for your patients. So not everyone is working one-on-one, -on -one, um, obviously, but a lot of health insurances take the lead of Medicare. So until Medicare started covering some things, then other health insurance companies will say, okay, well, we'll cover that too. But it takes a lot of pushing and nudging and advocating and educating for them to do that. So yeah. we still have more work to do. Every dietitian right now can respond to the um alert from the academy to get in touch with your state representatives about the MNT Act to further expand what dietitian services are covered. It's important. Um, but what things are covered with Medicare have a ripple effect far beyond a hospital setting. So that's the history and that wasn't quite as succinct as I intended. So I'm sorry. Um, no. But on top of that, we're largely women. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of beliefs that are not true that we need to unlearn and a lot of skills that we're not taught that we need to learn. Um, and that brings us to the conference. That's why I'm hosting it because I'm not the first person to talk about the money. I sure hope I'm not the last. Um, 
but the more of us stand and say that this is important, that we need to be advocates, we need to be better informed, we need to hold boundaries, it helps everyone. Yes, a hundred percent. And so I hope what people took away from that explanation is there's really no one simple answer. And this has been, it's looking back at the history and all these different facets of why we are in the situation. And I Googled it while you were talking, but I think it was 2002 when MNT started covering dietitians, but it was just for what kidney and, and diabetes. So it wasn't like it's super just exciting. That. Yeah. And that's not that long ago. I mean, I graduated high school in 2001. So a year after I graduated, it wasn't until after I, yeah, yeah. It wasn't until I got out of high school that, um, dietitians even got paid through Medicare and, you know, any subsequent insurance company. So really cool, um, looking at the history and it's just understanding like, wow, there's so many pieces to this puzzle. I think a lot of people think, um, it's almost oversimplified. Like the reason we don't get paid is this. The reason we don't get paid good enough is this. And here's who needs to fix it. (laughs) But what I want to talk about is what can people who are listening, because the whole topic is empowering dietitians to make more money. Like what are tangible things that listeners can do to become empowered to actually make more money? Like what are those things they could do other than becoming informed and, um, And just talking about it, like what, what are, does that make sense? Like tangible things? Um, lot, sorry. We have allergies going on hot here in Ohio. So I was <laughs> hoping I didn't sneeze. Um, <clears throat> so there is a lot and I would just encourage everyone to take imperfect action and which I know you love Katie. Yeah, we can make a lot of difference if we all just have the bravery to take imperfect action. Mm -hmm. And that can look like doing um, research around what positions are paid what, because on average, the dietitian salary is too low, but there are people who are making good money and ask them how they're doing it. (laughs) Ask questions. What are the steps that got them there? How did networking play a role? How did, um, marketing themselves in terms of how they show up on their resume and on their LinkedIn profile and how did other people speaking their name, recommending for them, impact them. We are a small profession, Katie. We are just over a hundred thousand people. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we're expected to grow 7% over the next 10 years. However, we have fewer and fewer people entering the profession And more people getting stuck, not being able to pass the exam, I think for a lot of reasons, Um, but our, the need for our services is continuing to grow and the people entering the field is going down, which means there's going to be a huge deficit, which that's not a good thing in terms of patient care. However, it does give us more leverage than we've ever had before to be able to advocate for our salary because hospitals are seeing more turnover, it's getting harder for people to choose clinical work. People are interested in things other than clinical, which that's fine too, but we still need dietitians in hospitals. And so dietitians need to step up their game. Yeah. So we need to talk about money more. We need to do our own research. We need to participate when the academy says, okay, we need everyone to talk to their representatives. We need to do that. Um, we need to negotiate um, and we need to work on our mindset too. So that when we hear about someone making more money, that we can feel inspired by that and make it feel like they're paving the way for me to do that too, instead of feeling jealous, that doesn't help us. Um, I believe a rising tide raises all ships. And that's what I believe. And I think we need to stop saying things like, well, what is the Academy doing? Yeah. One, they're doing a lot. And two, we don't need to, we need to be most protective of and most responsible for our own salary. Mm-hmm. Like that just to me comes across like um, 
maybe someone who doesn't know what to do. And so I'm like, oh, well, the heck with it. It's the academy's job anyway. Like we are our profession. I know it's not someone else's job more than my own to advocate for my own salary. Yeah. And I think that one final thing, sorry, this got kind of long again, Katie. Um, I, it really bothers me when people say like complaining in Facebook groups about an offer and people say, well, just don't take it. And what bothers me about that, Katie, is that there's a lot of privilege in being able to turn down an offer. So yes. if you have a lot of savings or if you have parents or a partner who is supporting you so that you can ride a wave of not having income while looking for a higher paid role or to start a business. So waiting for that income to come in, it takes time. There's privilege in that. So, and especially for like new grads who most of us have student loans when we finish school and to just be like, well, just don't take it. That just feels like victim blaming to me where I would much rather people say, well, if you need to take this job, fine, but don't stay there. Talk about money. Talk about when you could be eligible for a raise, what metrics would make you qualify for a raise according to this organization. And if they're not going to be able to grow your salary and come up with a plan that you can work on that together, keep looking for other jobs. You don't have to stay there. But I just, yeah. it really bothers me. Like, oh, just don't take it. Like, that's just such a simplistic and not helpful comment. Yeah. I think when you said that, I'm like, yes, a hundred percent, because that always bothers me too. Or when um, people blame dietitians who are in a situation where they have to take a low paying job because they're like, I just need to, I need money. I got to pay my bills. I got to feed my kids. I don't have a choice. And then like you kind of said, it's like, we're, we're blaming them or criticizing them. Like, oh, it's their fault. Our pay is so low. And it's like, no, no, no. We've been having this conversation. They're so multifaceted. But I think also when that happens, it makes people not want to talk about money because someone reached out, they shared, they asked. And then all of a sudden they were almost attacked for like, well, no, don't you dare take that versus I love what you said, like, sure, take it, but work on the skills to get that next higher paying job. So I, I, I really appreciate that you brought that up, Holly. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to summarize what you just said, because topic of this empowering dietitians to make more money. And you just gave lots of tangible things that people could do to empower themselves because there are things we could do. Absolutely. There's things we could do. So first off talking about money, having these conversations, doing the research. If you find someone who's like, oh my gosh, they're super successful. Have a conversation, talk to them. How did you get here? Like, you know, have conversations and figure out how could I do that too? Do action alerts from the academy. They make it so easy. Literally, all you have to do is put in your email and where you live and they like write everything for you. I, I do them all the time. I click a button and it goes to my um, representatives or my, um, you know, my people. And so, um, and you can edit them if you want to, but I, I usually don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at least do your action alerts. Um, negotiate. So working on like empowering yourself to negotiate. And that comes from like that research first, but when you get a job, negotiate, ask, I mean, the worst they're going to say is no. And I think people, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to go on a tangent. Yeah, I am. I, I think sometimes people worry with negotiation of like, oh, if I ask for more money, they're going to think I'm greedy or they'll take back the job offer. If they're offering you money, they want you to work for them. They're not going to be like, oh, they're negotiating. You can't have this job anymore. It's like, it, it's just a part of the process and so many other professions. And I'm also going to say so many men, they don't even think twice about negotiating and asking for I was more, just more money. Say that. Like, I don't think any man, <laughs> any man feels guilty for negotiating Yeah, about asking for more money. It is just part of the process. And another step further for a lot of you who are getting jobs at bigger organizations, when you're doing negotiations, you're talking to HR. You're not even talking to the person you're going to work with. And even if you are, that's okay. That's okay. You could always ask the worst they're going to say is no. The best they're going to say is yes or somewhere in between. And then you're like, oh, oh my gosh, thank goodness I said something. So negotiate. <laughs> Next mm -hmm. is working on mindset, um, which is a continual thing for every area of our life, but absolutely um, work on mindset. Take imperfect action. 
and be mindful of um, the words we are using and how we're talking about money to make, and, and I'm kind of paraphrasing what you said, but be mindful to not say it um, things about money in a way where we're a victim who, ha who has no control instead of being more empowered in how we talk about money. And so not complaining or judging other people, but really looking at what can we do and how can we um, help ourselves and others growing the profession. So that was my takeaway of all the things that dietitians can do to empower themselves to make more money. And it's one step at a time. Um, I know in the conference and we'll shift into the conference next because it's like, this is just one podcast. If you ever want to learn more, this conference that Holly has built is phenomenal. All the speakers, but I just want to give a shout out real quick because I'm a speaker too. And the session that I'm doing is called how to make more money in your traditional job and beyond. And what I love about this um, session I'm doing, I've actually never done this at all. I had to pull all the numbers um, up myself is I was able to show how I was able to make more money in my traditional job. I was able to max out and pay very quickly, like in less than half the time it should have taken me. And so I walk you through my own money journey and I walk through all of the things that happened, all the things that I did um, throughout um, a time period of about 10 years to um, get to a point where I was making six figures as a dietitian in a traditional job, not managing humans and not supervising like, you know, programs, humans or budgets. <laughs> So it's a regular job, six figures. But then I also talk about and beyond because you guys know I like the side hustles. So I'm very, very excited for the session. But I love it. All that to say, Holly, can you tell them more about the Dietitian Money Conference coming up at the end yeah. of September? So the conference is totally virtual. So you can attend in your jammies, in your power suit, whatever you're inspired with. The live portion of the conference is the 24th through the 27th of September, and each morning, three to five speaker sessions are released, so you can click play when you're ready, and then almost all of the speakers are available and have made themselves available for live Q&A sessions, so as an attendee, you can submit questions using the form ahead of their live Q&A, so that even if you're not available in your schedule to attend that particular Q&A, you can still submit your questions and hopefully get them answered by the speaker. Um, and then those are recorded. So then as an attendee, you have access to the speaker sessions, the live and then recorded um, Q&A sessions, as well as the community group for a full year. Mm -hmm. Plus, there are raffle prizes. So I'll be doing Several of the speakers have given really generous prizes um, for attendees, so there'll be a raffle, and if you're picked for a raffle, you'll get to pick from the prizes that are available. There'll be one or two a day, and then there's also a treasure trove of resources, so I'm a copywriter, so I'm sharing some things that I usually charge for, but I'm sharing for free, like how to price your work as a writer, which the lessons in there are applicable to things beyond writing. So even if you're not interested in copywriting, there's value there. Um, how to pitch, um, podcasts to listen to for inspiration. So it's really, there's a lot for everybody. And outside of your um, talk, Katie, I'm really excited about it because I think sometimes people assume that you have to be an entrepreneur to make good money as a dietitian. And there certainly are plenty of examples of people who are entrepreneurs who are making good money, but that's not for everybody. And there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. So yeah. I just love that you share, like when you understand the game that you're playing and the strategy towards your goal, you can make a big difference. And the other cool thing, when we think about negotiating, Katie, I think we often talk about the salary and that's the biggest thing to negotiate, but that's not the only thing. It can also yeah. be things like vacation and insurance and is this in person or not? And what are the days? Mm -hmm. Because in your work, when you were working for the VA, you worked four long days and had Friday off. And that was the space to begin having your side hustle, which has become your full hustle. Um, and I think that's really important to think about too. So like there are a lot of things that impact your quality of life and your job is a big one of them and feeling appreciated and having the flexibility to live your life outside of work is really important. So those are all things that you can negotiate. 
Um, other speakers, there's 18 of them all together. We represent dietitians from three different countries. Um, a couple of them are sharing different ways to have a side hustle. So I think plenty of us are interested in a little something extra and we have a lot of skills to offer. So there's specific sessions of how to do that. One is Lisa Andrews. She's giving a session about how to charge and host culinary demos, which is a really nice side hustle idea. Um, Liz is talking about how to publish online through Amazon, which is really nice. And Dana Fryer is talking about how to use recorded courses to have an extra income stream. So they're just really, oh, and then Kat Durston is talking about how to make money as a social media manager. And there's something for everybody. One of our speakers is a student, um, Lexi, and she's talking about how she has found meaningful, well-compensated work that's flexible around a very tumultuous schedule as a student and intern. Beyond that, um, we have two speakers who are um, offering wisdom from within the idea of having a private practice. One is how to hire the right people. That's Libby Parker. And what I like about that is that even if you are not in a position that you're hiring someone in the next year, I would like that if you're applying for jobs in the next year to think about from the perspective of the hiring manager, like get in their brain a little bit to help you be a stronger applicant. The other private practice kind of um, facing one is Amy Schultz, and she's talking about maximizing your revenue in an insurance-based practice. I think there's still a lot of myths about what it means to take insurance, and she helps to bust them and talks about how to maximize your income while still providing accessible services, because not everyone can pay out of pocket to see a dietitian, and they shouldn't have to. Um, so I love that. <clears throat> we have two different sessions about collaborating and networking. This is a small field. And so the more that we are collaborative and root for each other, that benefits everybody. It's not a competition. Gosh, they're so good. Um, Doreen Roto is talking about how to really optimize your resume. Not only is she a dietitian, she is a certified resume writer. I didn't know that was a thing until we were hosting this. So she has a lot of wisdom. And then of course, negotiating. Alexis Williams is talking about how to negotiate your salary, which those are skills all of us need. Yes. And then Laura Jean is an Australian dietitian and she has a really wonderful session about finding work that aligns with your values. If you're not doing the work that your heart is calling you to do, there's going to be an underlying level of resentment or disease, um, being ill at ease, not disease. <laughs> um, and so just tuning into the work that is most meaningful to you, what's the work that you were meant to do yeah. is worth it. Yes. Yeah. I am um, so excited about your lineup, Polly. They're so good. Matthew Landry is talking about public policy which as we talked earlier about that really impacts. And then Stacy dunn Emke, the amazing Stacy dunn Emke, she is, you may know her from Nutrition Jobs. She has a really awesome job board. But this year she also launched um, a salary transparency, uh, I'm losing my words, website where you can log in and submit your own details anonymously. And then- you have access to every other one and there are something like 2,500 entries. So in terms of researching your own salary, her database mm -hmm. offers a lot more detail. So if you want to look by not just dietitians or specific state, but also what kind of work are people doing and how much are they getting paid? It's really interesting. So it's just a nice way to, um, empower yourself with more facts. Yes. 
One thing I really like that you've done this year. So for, for people like, yes, I'm in, or even if, yes, I'm interested, go to katiedodd.com. You'll find my affiliate link right there. It says the Dietitian Money Conference. And when you click on that, scroll down and you'll see all of the speakers, their beautiful faces, their names, what they talk about. But the cool thing is on most of them right underneath it, there's a watch their video here. So you actually could watch a snippet of them sharing what they're going to talk about. You're going to see their energy, their excitement. You'll get all fueled up and ready to go before the doors even open because these are some amazing dietitians that Holly has pulled together. So that's one thing I know that you did. I'm like, that's cool. Like it gets me excited. It is exciting. And the thing is, I've tried to make this conference as accessible as possible. So a lot of people are interested in CEUs. I hadn't mentioned yet that there are almost yes. 18 CEUs approved for this event. That's a lot. Um, the early bird price, which is open now at the time of this podcast being released, um, is two forty seven. Mm -hmm. And I also offer a student rate of ninety seven. So if you're a student, if you're an intern or someone who's just graduated and doesn't have the funds to pay the early bird price, please um, accept my warm welcome and please register with the student rate. It is really important to me that this information be as accessible as possible because that is how we make a difference. So if you would like to come and the early bird rate is outside of your means, please feel welcome to register with the student rate. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Holly, for joining us today, um, talking about things that we could do as a dietitians to empower ourselves, empower ourselves for making more money, talking about the Dietitian Money Conference. I, again, a quick shout out, go to katiedodd.com to get my link, my affiliate link. When you join, you get a free group call with me. So we'll talk on money on Zoom so you can pick my brain too. Um, my top tips on how to get the most out of the conference and my freebie folder. So before, <laughs> before we wrap up, Holly, can you tell people where they can find you online? Um, my main work is hollylarsonwrites.com. So if you're looking for mentorship, if you're looking for my writing course, if you're looking to hire me as a writer, that's where you can find me, hollylarsonwrites.com. Um, but since today, since that we're mostly focused on the money conference, I would advise you to get there through Katie's link tree so that you can get her bonuses when you register. And I'm just really excited to connect with more dietitians who are feeling empowered, who want to feel empowered, who want to be solution oriented, because that's how we change things. We've come a long way, um, but we have a lot more ground to cover. And I like to say, if not now, then when do you want to be, get this great job offer posted, or this great job opportunity posted, and then you're trying to sleuth on how to update your resume really quickly? Or do you want to have some offer land in your lap and you don't know if it's a good one because you haven't done your research. I want everyone to be empowered as much as possible right now yes. so that things will improve and grow and be more abundant for all dietitians everywhere. We deserve it. Deserve Absolutely. It. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Holly, for being here. And thank you for the work that you're doing. This is really important work that you were doing for the profession and individuals. And I just think it's so lovely. So thank thanks you. for being on the podcast and thank you everyone for listening. Be sure to go register for the money conference. I will be there. <laughs> Bye guys.